to her about her, uh, start off with her who, her who fandom, and then we'll move on to any cool and upcoming projects that she has on the burner, um, and a little bit of who news uh, that uh, Drew will bring to the table tonight. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I'm totally amazed. No, you know what I'm talking about. I actually have a quick question for you. Yes, do. When was your first... GPR panel. Was it at What the Hell Con? It was at What the Hell Con. So we had, With you. Yeah, we so we had our, our first panel together. Yay. Yay. There we go. Oh, boom. Oh, we got it. Ready? And then we can do this one. Ready? Snail. Oh. oh. Snail. <laughs> um, I'm not with it. I'm not with it. And then, oh, hold on, hold on. One more time. Ready? I can do this. And then I go, Dalek. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, just, I made that up. I got this dialect from the 3D printer in the hallway downstairs. It's very awesome. It has no... No plunger. No plunger and no eye stalk. And or they no... It has no gun. Blip, blip, blip gun. They said that because um, there was nothing to support it as it comes in level after level, there's that. no base for it. But you can... We can use a little bit of heat and put a little... I'm going to go to a, a doll store and find a plunger and paint it black and glue it there. They have a doll store on High Point Road. Apparently, it's a they doll do. store warehouse. Yes. Wow. I've been wanting to go because it's, that sounds it's like... It's called the, the doll market, the and doll it's, market. it's not a stripper club. It's, it's actually, they sell dolls, like Barbie dolls. They don't yeah. sell miniatures for doll houses. <laughs> oh, they don't. No, it just it's seems just, like the creepiest place in the world to me. It is. And, it I, just, and, and I go all there, those dead I used to go there all the time and buy my sock monkey outfits. <sighs> wow. Mm-hmm. Okay, back to Doctor Who. Eh, that old <laughs> So, what was your... First exposure to Doctor Who. My first exposure to Doctor Who was many, many years ago. I won't say when, but it was in the mid to late seventies um, when it was on PBS Channel Thirteen in the New York, New Jersey area, and uh, we only got on a good day thirteen channels on the television if uh, one of the kids in the family could be bribed into holding an antenna, and we used to take turns literally uh, doing that, and we used to love to watch Doctor Who because it was just so cheap and awesome. And that was it. So who was your first doctor? My first doctor was Tom Baker. And in Old Who, he was my favorite doctor. Now, this is before I knew he was a jerk and he was mean and nobody <laughs> liked him and he smelled. And whatever all his problems were, he was my first oh, yeah. Old Who. And he, so he's my favorite Old Who doctor. Well, I mean, you know, I think, I think you have to look at it in two different lights. One, Baker the actor, you know, and then Baker is Who. He was never a good actor, let's be honest. I've seen him in the Sinbad movie where he played the bad guy. See, I want to see. Role, I want to see him in the Sinbad like movie. And he's wearing a burka. He's wearing a yeah. burka the whole time. And he's like, do my will. And you're just not buying it. You're not inclined to do his will at all. <laughs> that was part of the reason he got the role for Doctor Who. Is that movie came out around the same yeah. time that they were looking to. Really? And that's that was my first introduction to Tom Baker, was, yeah. was the Sinbad movie. I, I know I had seen Doctor Who before that, but, but that was... But now, thanks to DVD, I get to see all of the old stuff that I never saw before. And YouTube is just amazing, too. But you can collect the DVDs, and I can catch up and realize stuff. Yeah. So many. Drew and me in the DVDs. But I'm like a normal Who fan, because I watch the show, and I enjoy it, and then I go on with my life. Like, I didn't find out till today there were four different scarves that Tom Baker wore in the course of the show. 
completely clueless, lived my whole life, very functional without that knowledge. <laughs> but now I'm interested because now there's like the lime green and the army green and the, the strawberry red and the cherry red. I don't know. It was just the long scarf Lengths, and the stripe. Lengths. And then you've got the. Uh, this, is, this is my point. The final season uh, when uh, J and T started up with the uh, red scarf. Yeah. Or the scarlet scarf. I would like to get. A, I would like to get a scarlet scarf. Yeah, sure. As well. Well, yeah. well, my baker's scarf. Doll, out of doll parts. Yeah. Well, my baker's the one baker's scarf I do have is made out of wool, which I only wear on occasion. But the reason why I would want the, the last the red scarf is because of Davidson wearing it for all of. Five minutes. And gotcha. nobody knows that's cute. But that's neat. No. That's good. So you're no. like a normal fan and you're like a real fan. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it gets, you know, it's like there's I'm, a I'm scale. realizing there's a scale. And like, you know, Davey, Davey and I are, are you know, we're, we're up there. On a but, scale of one to ten, you're both freaks. And I'm like a solid five and a half or six. Oh, no, no, no. no. You're like a four. Oh, am I? And, and oh, we're, like, we're like a six and a half or seven. Really? No, like, I would say she's actually, no, I have to say it. I would have to say she's probably more like a two or a three, to be perfectly honest. I did so good on your doctor. Yeah, no, quiz. no, no, no. You wait until you, he, you hear what a ten is. Really? Yeah. Who's a ten? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Stephen in Edmonton. Um, well, I don't need people who Josh write in New Jersey. Them. No, I'm no, I'm just, there are, I'm, I, I listen to other Doctor Who podcasts. Oh really? And um, I thought I was a Doctor Who fan. I and here's the thing: you impressed well, me. You knew about the four scarves. Well, I mean, I'm I'm a fan, and I've done my research, especially in the last year. But keep in mind, there are people who are are at have been at the level I'm at currently their entire lives, and oh. they have absorbed like a very creepy, weird sponge every little bit of information. Um, and yeah, they're 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 tens. But that's their thing, and that's awesome. And that's their thing, and that's that, awesome. that is their thing. Yeah, I have other things. I have things that I'm freaky about like that, but it's a different. Show. My wife doesn't think I have any more, um, like things going on there. But I, you know, like Doctor Who really has kind of taken over my. I was joking my life. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm a huge Whovian. Um, You know, I'm not on the scale of, like some of those guys that you, that you tell me about. But because like also another another thing that I'm really big into is Star Wars, and one time. I ran the Trivia Pursuit board Did on my really? first turn. That's uncool, man. And people got mad. I would. Yeah, and the thing is, is I actually got the easy production question because there's that one production category. I can't remember what. Are we it talking was. about Star Wars Trivia Pursuit? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah. I'm just like, right. I ran. I ran, I ran the board one time. I didn't know there was a Star Wars Trivia Pursuit. Yeah, I, I was actually. I good. wouldn't even bother with a Star Wars Trivia Pursuit. I couldn't do it. Could not do it. Even with the news that we got two days ago, yeah, I'm still just I was when I was younger. Star Wars was my Doctor Who as a kid, but yes, I could say that when I was young, he was. But then, um, and then George Lucas ruined it and kept ruining it, and he said, "Oh, here's some childhood of yours left. Let me see if I can screw that up some more." Okay, back to who? Yes. Um, so um, out of the classic stuff, do you have a particular moment um on the show that you just really cherish, you really like, or that's extremely memorable to you. I love the scene where he's inside the TARDIS and there's uh, Layla, the cave lady, right? Yeah. Okay, I got that right. I am in two. Okay, and, and <laughs> he's holding two objects and he goes, which one is bigger? <laughs> I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say an apple and a book, but I'm sure Uber Nerd 1 and Uber Nerd 2 will tell you what they are. And she goes, well, of course it's the apple. And he goes, right. And then he like walks across the room and does this. He goes, now which one? She goes, oh, you daft. It's still the apple. He goes, excellent. You are more clever than a monkey. And I'm like, that is so British. And that is, I love that moment because I like to do that now to my brothers and, and to other people I know and use that very same line to very subtly and subtle. So what episode? I don't know. Oh, you lost a point. True. That's okay. What episode? I, I, I had no idea. They're not tens. No, he never said we I were. I misled you earlier. No, we're, we're not, we're not yeah. tens. I remember the episode. The funny thing is, that moment came on, and the only thing I could think of when I watched it was there's an episode of Father Ted where um, Ted is trying to um, explain to the uh, Arlen O'Hanel who played um, the cat man in, um, uh, it's not called Traffic, see, Brain, see, not then, um, <laughs> what's with the bumper to more cars and the and macros like underneath down, it, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't exit because there's, right. Yeah. I actually know that episode. Yeah. 2.4. Oh, 
There you go. You're, 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 you're coming you're, down. I'm, so you're going to take my knowledge. I'm going down. You're coming awesome. neck up, and then we'll just meet somewhere in the middle. Anyway, I had, there was a point to this. It involved Father Ted. But if you haven't seen Father Ted, you should watch it. I'm not even going to bother explaining it. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just bring it over one night, and we'll watch uh, It'll be fun. Uh, alcohol, cigarettes, and rollerblading. Yes. So um, Back to Doctor Who. Yeah, back to Doctor my Who. My next favorite scene is where him and the companions are running through the rocks underground. That's like every episode. Don't wait, the underground rocks the or under, the above ground rocks? Specifically the underground rocks. Gotcha. Which companions? Any of them. They just throw all the <laughs> rocks at that point. The companions? Yeah. <laughs> no, the rocks. Of course the companions. He, he, needs, he needs a paper mache rock companion. It'd make him happy. I would like to see Anthony be the new companion. I really, really would. This is the new who. I'd like to see Anthony. Anthony. Um, the the, the, the Ponza's kid. Yeah. Ponza's kid, I'd like to see. Yeah. The kid. I, I, I don't even know if Or that... Stormageddon. Those would both be... I, 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 have, I, I have a film where, as long as Muppet's on, I have a film where we're going to see Stormageddon again. My, my dream, and I've had to this several times, is I'd like to see a lone wolf and cub with the doctor with Stormageddon strapped on his back. Not with a katana. Like Master Blaster. Like Master Blaster, right? Well, he would have a sonic screwdriver. I mean, that is his katana. There you go. Sure. There you it go. Happen. It, could, it could happen. So, moving from Classic Who, um, and jump in with any questions if you have any. All right. To pick our brain. What, um, who, who would be your favorite of the, uh, the new Who Doctors? Matt Smith. I love him. I really, truly, truly do. He is, I, I love him because he, he's not cute, he's not handsome, he's not, but he's so charming and he's so exuberant and he's, I don't know why, but I just really feel a connection to him. Um, I, maybe because he reminds me of my best friend in high school, Oliver. There's just something about him. Um, I just, I really do feel a connection to him. But before my, before he came on the scene, uh, I liked Eccleston, so. It's cool. Why'd you like Eccleston? I'm just curious. I liked his jacket, really. It, was, it looked warm. <laughs> I'm always cool. Well, there was like a seriousness to him yeah. that I could kind of relate to, and I thought that for a long time the Doctor, um, it was it was a nice bridge who, you know, because the Doctor was always so very serious. Tom Baker never cracked a smile. They, they were always just very, everything what? was so intense. Baker always cracked a smile. Well, not from my point of view. I'm kind of, I guess, I didn't think so. Anyway, I thought he was a good transitional who to bring you from the old who to the new who. I don't know if it's true or not, it's my belief. I believe in lots of crazy things. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite moment uh, in new who? Happy tears. The Christmas ep I always cry in the Christmas episodes. I'm such a sucker for that. And I love the episodes where the, I guess this would be two Christmases ago, where the mother, the witch, and not the line, the witch in the wardrobe episode, but it's the episode that just sounds like that, like the TARDIS, the sun such, and two other things that make sense. And he's like, <laughs> happy tears, and he's crying at the end, and I just burst out. His Which throat. doctor? It was Matt Okay, so it was his first one, Christmas Carol. No. It was his second one. It's his second because one. Because in, in the first wait, one, wait, wait. he was talking about having married Marilyn, and then they had the bull sharks pulling the Christmas Yeah, bread. Christmas Carol. So, so the line, the witch, in the wardrobe one. Right, but it wasn't called the line. Yeah, the yeah. It was the, called the, like the mother and three other things that it's, sense. it's okay. It's uh, the doctor, the wardrobe, and, and widow. The widow. The widow and something yeah. else. Sorry, I got really confused. I thought you said it wasn't that episode. No, it wasn't. So. That okay, episode. yeah. But I love the line "Happy Tears," and I still use it. And actually, other mortally mundane people like me actually get that. So apparently, more people are watching who, or just using that catchphrase and, and it spreads. So. Well, uh, Doctor Who is now Toys R Us. He is. He's yeah, at Toys R Us. Another place to dump. Get my dog. Well, I think that's very important because as much as I love my local gaming shop, unfortunately they have to charge such exuberant prices to get Doctor Who toys. And unfortunately, I will probably be buying my stuff at Toys R Us because they're a major conglomerate and they don't have to pay. Well, exuberant. right now they still have the higher price because oh, they're not well, buying because they're function. not buying in bulk yet because they want to see if there's a market here. Yeah, still no but I mean, market. they're slowly getting more and more stuff there. So I think if it looks like it's going to sell, because their website, you should see the amounts that they have on the website versus what they have in the store. Oh, really? So I think they were testing on the website, they tested a few products in the store, and they're just adding little by little. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, and actually some of the stuff, like the Comic-Con exclusive stuff that they had, is actually fairly decently priced 
uh, as opposed to like you know your Ebays and stuff like that, and your Amazons where you have the secondary sellers. So I mean, I think they're trying to find that middle ground um, to make it cheap enough. Um, and if I think they get more sales, we might get to see more a, a more stable, lower price if they're able to you know ship it in bulk. That's fair. Which I, I would like to just pimp in really quick if I could that my local gaming yeah. shop is the Grinning Gamer in Greensboro, and they have a website which I'm sure it's grinninggamer.com, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yes. Um, do you have any any questions? Do I have any questions? Uh, you know, it's it's funny. Okay, so I, I was going to ask you about the the new season because it seems like every time that we've had a conversation where we've wanted to go, <laughs> gosh, we wish we had. A camera right now to yeah. to film. So I, I wanted. I'm kind of curious about what you thought of the the new season. That's okay. Whole. First, my first question is, what is this? Is this season eleven? Season. We're we're at series seven, A. Uh huh. Okay. So this last season, I was not a fan of. Right. Now I will preface it by saying I enjoyed every single episode as I watched it, and I enjoyed the episode upwards to twenty minutes to an hour later. But then I would be sitting watching like a repeat of Copper, and I would be like, why does this feel like, in retrospect, that this current episode of Doctor Who was maybe like three IQ points higher than one of the Sarah Jane Chronicles, which is just fart and burp jokes, which in its place and setting is funny. But I just didn't feel that this current season had, um, it lacked a real maturity. We all knew the pawns were going to die, or were going to be leaving, or doing whatever, and so that surprise was out of the bag. But there was no tension, and this it wasn't until this last episode of Doctor Who, the very last episode of the season, where I finally believed, for the first time ever, that um, uh, Amelia Amy loved Rory. I always thought up until that episode, she would have left Rory like that for the Doctor in a heartbeat. Because up until that point, every other companion, completely believable, and rightfully so, who wouldn't? But I never believed Amy when she's like, I love Rory, I love Rory, you're not a girl, your vote doesn't count. So, but when she's like staring down the angel at the end and she's talking, I'm like, huh, she really does love Rory. I never would have bought that. I would have thought in a heartbeat she would have left him. And, you know, in my poor little centurion, I would have picked him up. I don't even like Rory, but I would have picked him up because how dare she, the cruel thing. But, um, <laughs> but I finally believed it, and I finally bought them as a couple that really loved and was a united front, and and then, of course, they're gone. Right. Well, th this is a question I'm going to have for both of you since we're, ta we're talking, you know, series 7A, since this is just the first half of the season. Um, the middle point will be the Christmas special, and then we'll go on to 7B. Do you think this whole thing with the ponds is sort of like a red herring, a misdirect? So we're, we're missing something obvious because he's showing us this thing, why is this other thing's occurring? I'm not sure I understand the question. Like Are a shell saying... game. It, do you think he's playing a shell game here? He's showing us the obvious thing he wants us to see, like a magician. Mm -hmm. The magician shows you something he wants you to see to misdirect you to see what the actual trick is. Right. Well, what you're saying is that the ponds leaving is not the important part, right. or that the ponds haven't left. No, that or... the ponds have left was the, the thing that misdirected everybody. That's the reason why they didn't hide the fact. They, were, they openly talked about it, because they wanted everybody to focus on that, and not this other thing that Moffat's doing that, you know, we're just not seeing yet, and we won't see until the end of 7B. I knew numerous times you've said in the house, and I don't know if you've said on the podcast, that it seems like the episodes are out of order. Yeah. And I, I, once you said that, it seemed like it made total perfect sense. And you also made reference to uh, there was always a light bulb flickering or lighting was always an issue. Or <laughs> oh. And I'm like, oh, that has to be something. There. That's that's like that's like bad wolf all over again. Which I felt so smart when I finally turned to my husband and I went, I was like, that's like the third episode in a row we've seen bad wolf. He's like, no, it's not. And then of course that was the whole point of the damn thing. Yeah, we <laughs> we we get that in every single episode. I think Moffat is um... evil. Let's start with you. Evil. Want to be, think <laughs> evil. I'll take you one better. Do you guys want to hear another agenda that they've got that I, I, I only I okay. <laughs> I already believe it, by the way. Before you right. say it, I'm a subscriber to it. Okay. The Bible agenda. I don't know what that means, but I love it. <laughs> every every episode of the new season has um, Bible, biblical references in it. Every single one. Nabu, which one? Pick one. The last episode, Pawn's disappearing. What was the Bible? Uh, well, you have angels, so, right? 
Oh, um, all right, that's not a biblical reference. Angels appear in every culture at every time of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Mike McShane's character was named Grail. Though which one is Mike McShane? Mike McShane is the collector. Okay, now I know who that is. He's a uh, improver. Um, he was, I think, fire talk in the um, uh, Kevin Costner Robin Hood. I know it's been a while. I, no, no, no. I know that movie because it was so rank. It was so historically inaccurate. Which mythologist? Uh, but I, I, I <laughs> but I, the collector. Yeah, uh, his his name was Grail. Okay. Again, not and necessarily he the Grail, and it was biblical per yeah. se. Mm -hmm. um, there was another one. I, I don't remember uh, what it was. There, I think it was one of those. Um, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. Biblical, biblical. Oh no, not really. It's like the light bulb. Um, the, there was. I don't think there was a light bulb reference in the fourth one. There wasn't a uh, Christmas reference in the fourth one. Well, it's Christmas is. Enough for me. In in there, but uh, no, no, no. What I was saying is, um, there's a, the Christmas agenda. Um, yeah. Davey pointed this one out. Christmases were referenced in, in the first, I believe, three. Yes, he did. They referenced Christmas in, in yeah. all. And I'm yeah, like, oh, and yeah, and they just stopped. But you get the Daleks. The Daleks. Um, there's a um, kind of references to hell in the second mm -hmm. one with uh, uh, you have a character named Solomon. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's an ark. Yeah. Yes. Right. Oh yeah. Uh, in the third one, town called Mercy. Everyone has a biblical name. You've Worst got creatures. episode of the entire season A or whatever you're calling it. It was terrible. I absolutely, absolutely 100 percent agree with you. Oh. Well, I'll say this much: I went in hating, wanting to hate the episode, and I at least enjoyed it. But if I was going to say I had a least favorite of the season. It's probably that one. Really? After all the complaining about Power of Three that then, you've done? Yeah, and then, then, yeah. The I, charmed I, ones. I now have... The Power of Three. I, I now have issues. Yeah, I mean, going back on Power of Three, I, I, I have more problems with it now. Mm -hmm. But now we're talking about Mercy again. I'm like, yeah, this is, yeah, I just... Because I actually went in wanting to hate Mercy, so I... I liked it a bit better. Sure. Because I had, like, no expectations for that one. And, you know, I got I got a little something out of it. I, I was entertained, at least. Well, you're lucky I wasn't even entertained. I was... You well, only, you only see it once, yeah? Yeah. Well, I'm a normal person. I watch it, and if I enjoy it, I watch it maybe a second time if it's in between episodes of Cop Copper or, like, uh, some, other BB, some other BBC. No, I love Copper. I was just saying I love oh, Copper. Oh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to uh, it coming out on... Netflix or DVD, so I can watch them. Uh, it came out last week Leakers or this week on, D on DVD. So in six months, I got it on Netflix. Right. Yeah. Okay. It'll keep. It'll keep. I got I got other things to watch. Yeah. So. Luther. I want to watch Luther. Luther's great. Now he was that actor, whatever his name was. Idris he Elba. was a potential. He was. At some he was. Point. He was really high in the ranks, and um, I haven't seen him enough other than in Thor to to make a statement as whether or not I think. He I would haven't seen good. Thor, but based on Luther. And just based on Luther, mm -hmm. he'd have been an angry doctor. He'd have been an angry, angry, cranky doctor. Ang angry would be fine. I think angry doctor's time has passed. Oh, long ago. And will will come back again. But I think Matt Smith is, for me, is it's kind of nice having a refreshing, almost Troutman character. Um, kind of the ugly. See, that, that's what I'm talking about. When he says dinosaurs on a spaceship, mm -hmm. that's like, a, the way he says it, there's just such four-year-old joy and exuberance Fonting force, ah, fonting force from him. It's it's just you believe it. You can feel Absolutely. that joy and that excitement, and thank God they come and grab him and run because dinosaurs on a spaceship. Yeah. But um, it was is incredible. He's I just love Matt Smith's whatever it is he brings. Uh, it's it's contagious. Sure. Well, um, what would you like to see in future episodes? Ooh, I would like to see nothing like Seven A. I I want to see. More um, more episodes of the seriousness tonality of the Doctor Donna episodes, uh -huh, uh, sure. or with, with that with that companion, but that sort of maturity, fun, action packed. It, mm -hmm. does, does that make sense? No, I, I, I get okay. what you're saying. Um, and I would like to see, for me, a truly compelling uh, companion. I didn't buy the palms because I I could never believe Amy was not um, attached to Rory. And so she never came off as a as a good companion. I didn't like. I loved Donna because she had no interest in the Doctor other than as a friend to go partying with. But then she couldn't stay around. And I, I really liked her as a companion a lot. Um, I didn't like Mickey the idiot. I, I didn't care for Rose. Mm -hmm. I know my husband loves Rose on many levels, but it was just 
she's just kind of annoying to me. I, I don't know what it is about Rose. I just didn't get it. Um, and then there was the other one whose name I can't remember. Martha. Martha. I didn't care for Martha. I, in fact, that would probably be the season I watched the least amount of episodes of because I just, um, she was like nails on a chalkboard for me. Mm. I don't know why. Um, maybe because she was, as far as companions go, the most intellectually ch comparable to the doctor. Not that, you know, because he's always going to be way up here, right. but she was a doctor and she was smart and she was educated. And I don't care because that's not what I want my companion to do. I want my companion to reel back the doctor and keep his humanity and keep his focus. And she was all about me, but what about me? And I'm like, well, who cares about you? You're a companion. <laughs> You're either going to die or he's going to ditch you. You're like canine. Just get another one out the closet. And that's how I felt about her, and she was always me, 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 and I'm like, me, me, me. I don't think that, it, I, I think it's Martha, I thought Martha had potential, but the writers had no idea what to do with her. Um, and their issues, they almost wrote her like Rose Light in mm -hmm. a lot of ways, and that really bothered me. And she's a much better actress than she was on that show. Because I've oh, seen yeah. her in Law and Order UK, yeah. and she's by far more wonderful then she was, she did not give her best. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe she didn't take the genre serious or the topic serious or whatever it was serious. She just didn't show up for work 100%. I, I don't think they gave her stuff to work with. A, a, real, a good actor can work with what he gets. And she's, she did not apply herself. I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with the statement of a real actor because I, I know that people like Ewan McGregor and... Um, the entire cast sans Samuel L. Jackson in episode one. They're good actors, but you know, you get a bad director, it, it can be a problem. I, but I, that being said. Speaking of I will I will counter your point. Snakes on a plane delivered. The title was the plot and it was the most entertaining movie that a, that the Dollar Movie Theater has ever done. It did everything it promised. Snakes on a plane. And everyone showed up for work with energy and applied themselves. Brilliant. Martha couldn't do that two episodes in a row. Okay. Well, I'm not going to argue with Snakes on a Plane, because I love Snakes on a Plane. Have I ever told you my Snakes on a Plane story? No. I went with a, a group uh, for one of the group's 18th birthday, and before the show I, I bought a large quantity of rubber snakes from the dollar store, and during the show I started throwing them in the theater. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. It was really good. Um, I, have a, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, because you're not like a big Who fan like Drew and I are, what do you want to see out of because of the 50th anniversary that we're coming off to? Well, considering I just learned that the 50th anniversary is coming up, um, I would like to see I would like to see a two-hour. Whatever it is, I'd like to see them do it in two hours. I want it totally explored and covered. Um, I would like to see them revisit some of the stuff that they let storylines drop. Um, there was like three things I was going to mention that I now can't think of. Um, Old stuff or new stuff? New stuff. Mm -hmm. New stuff. Like I would like. In the two in the fiftieth anniversary, for them to air Rory's P.S. to the episode because I saw it on the internet mm -hmm. and I thought Rory's summation of because I felt bad for the dad I felt bad for Brian and I'm like oh my god I can't believe they didn't cover Brian he's at home watering plants waiting for them to come home and he's gonna die old and alone wondering is today the day they come home and now there's another train wreck life that the doctor has left he doesn't know what's happened. But Rory wrote the most wonderful letter, and they should have filmed it, and it was so beautiful. And I was like, that is the one they should have went with, instead of Amy's, which was meh, 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 meh. <laughs> Rory's was so heartfelt, and it was so touching, and it tied up everything perfectly. Even if they had done it after hers, or if they had said at the end of the show, there's an extra two minutes if you don't want to go to the toilet or run to the kitchen and get more ice cream, watch this. Everyone would have said, oh, no, no, more Doctor Who, two minutes, and we would have sat down and watched it. Instead, we all had to go to the internet and watch the storyboards. And it was just, it was so lovely and touching. I want that aired. I want them to force that into conversation somehow. Um, I want to see more of the Doctor's wife, um, River. I really like River, and the actress is not really aging well. So I'd like to see her get as much airtime as possible. I want to see all of that resolved. Um, what, what's left not to be resolved? Well, there were two other things I couldn't think of. Or no, I, I mean, what, what? I mean, what's there left to be resolved with uh, River? I want to see River in more stuff. I like River. Um, she's wonderful and she's lovely, and I want to know without ever having to see it because I know the Doctor himself is squishy about it. That I would like to see the Doctor be a father again, to like a character that is his child, not like some character who is his child who's coming back. 
I want to know that there was a family situation between him and River, and that this is the child of that family situation, and I would like to see her come in and out of his life with the baby, or the teenager, or then the three-year-old, because that would be hysterical. Her going in, like, you know, lovey, and have a three-year-old, and them running and going, not now, and then her leaving, and then 15 minutes into the episode, come back with a teenager, and him like, better time, you know, I know you wouldn't like it. I would like that, because as a girl, we like that sort of stuff. We do. Trust me. I trust you. Thank you. See? Married? <laughs> the same. I think I answered your question, but I wanted to see two hours, more river, child, Rory. Uh, you know, I, I, I would happily go on record saying that the introduction of Brian Williams is the best part of season 7A. So which one is Brian Williams? Brian Williams. <laughs> oh, the father. The father. Okay. Yeah. Well, sometimes yeah. I don't know everybody's names. That's why I said I'm mortal. But if you had just said Brian, I would have known right. who you were talking yeah. about. I think Brian. I think Brian, for me, was actually the best part. I know a lot of people would disagree with that, but um, I really liked him. I felt compelled by that character, and uh, I, liked I him cared. When well, I mean, he brought something. For, he brought that 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 wonderment back to the companion, and that's yeah. That's mm -hmm. the thing is, I understand now. A lot better now. Why a companion really should only last a season? Um, what do you think? Is because the moment they get used to traveling, um, you lose the best. To me, you lose the best part of watching Doctor Who, which is taking somebody to something they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Amy, once Rory got on board, Amy had already got on. You know. It was, uh, old, old hat. it was old hat. It was old hat. She, I don't think she ever really was impressed by the locations that Dr. showed her. And mm -hmm. Rory could care less. He was just wanted just to go with Amy. Amy. Yeah. Okay, now I have a question that you, you bring that up. Is that just in New Who, or does, does that also apply in Classic Who? I think that happens in Classic Who as well. But, I mean, should they only last one season, including classic, because I, I don't know, I, I thought because the stories were longer, more drawn out, with, with classic, they were able to explore some of those companions better. I, th I, don't, I think comparing New Who and Old Who is is a very slippery slope because they are vastly, vastly different shows. Exactly, that's, that's why I'm asking, you right. know, you're saying that, you know, a companion no, only lasts I don't want anyone series. to retroactively go back and, and remove any of my Sarah Jane episodes, but I'm you know, from, from, you know, both three and four. But I'm saying in, in New Who, with the technology that they have, they're not just showing up at rock quarries again, you know? Right. Yeah. So it's just like, you can give the audience a brand new world, and we're seeing that world for the first time, but we're seeing it usually through the eyes of the companion. And, and there are, the companions are a proxy. Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking at the world, the adventures of the Doctor through the companion. And, you know, you got a good companion, we as an audience are going to enjoy it more. If you have a questionable companion, or if you have a surly companion that doesn't like what they're doing, mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be nearly as enjoyable for us. So That's true. We need the companion for the doctor to explain things to, mm -hmm. so that we can know what's going on. Sure. And, and I get that. Um, a non-talking head character. Right. Well, there have been smart, there have been smart companions in the past who get it, um, but Brian sitting outside of the TARDIS, eating a sandwich and drinking a cup of tea, or a cuppa, uh, and looking at the world was my highlight of the entire season. That was pretty awesome. Uh, that I, it's the only time I shed a tear. Um, I really liked it because that's what I like about Doctor Who. I like the idea that we're getting like, you know, if I got a chance to travel with the Doctor, I mean like, could you imagine ever getting bored? You probably wouldn't live that long. But so when the companions are like, oh, it's a hominid, here we are, we're back on Metabelius 3 again. Not that that happened in the series, but let's say it did. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, here, it's another planet ruled by psychic moths. You know, hmm. <laughs> you know, that, so the planet. moment they don't, they stop caring, I stop caring. That's true. I thought Amy and Rory did. Well, she was always job. a little pissy when she's like, I "Thought we were going to ancient Egypt, and this looks like Virginia." Well, that's going to yeah. happen every embrace, time. Embrace wherever you are, because that's where the TARDIS sent you. you sure. just, just be happy. And she was always whining. Yeah. I always, I was like, "Ha uh ha." -huh. You are not alone. There is a lot of Amy hate out there. 
There's a lot of Amy hate. She was, in, she was ungrateful. She was absolutely, nobody cares for Jim. She was ungrateful. She really, truly was. I had seen a, a meme on Facebook, imagine that, that said, which would you rather hear? If you could only hear one sentence to change your life, would it rather be, you're a wizard, or I'm the doctor? <laughs> I'm the doctor. I would love <laughs> to hear I'm the doctor. I wouldn't even tell my I would just I'd just be like and I would go. And I would come back fifteen minutes later, like ten years older, and um, Or so you hoped. Or so just, I hoped. Just fifteen I'd hope to minutes come back. later. I'd hope to come back. <laughs> this is a horrible thing, but um, uh, I would rather hear you're a wizard, uh, mainly because I don't think the doctor would pick me as a companion. <laughs> Why not? I I don't think I'm companion material. I really don't. One, I'm not a cute girl. And that, you yeah, know. Well, you're like the Ian Chesterfield. <laughs> maybe, maybe he would pick your wife, and then you could be her Rory, or, or her Mickey the Idiot. And you could go along and every once in a while do like a Christopher Walken imitation and like buy your ticket, you know what I'm saying? Well, if the doctor man. wants Christopher Walken, he's going to pick up Christopher Walken. Dude, <laughs> dude, dude. because Christopher Walken's likely to kill the companion. Why did you do it? Dude, you're the Ian Chesterfield of companions. I, 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 yeah. I'm I'm more of. Um, <laughs> I don't know who Chesterfield is. I just pointed. Which one was he? Chesterton was the um, the the uh, the Scottish very guy? he was the very first male companion. Was he the Scottish guy? No, no, that was Jamie. Yeah, oh, that's right. Jamie. That was Jamie. I loved him. He was he was the original Mickey the idiot. Here, <laughs> it's you're not far off. It's no, it's, he it's, was. it's 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 probably fairly true in that one. I think there's a, of all our companions coming back. I think that the the best chance of getting a classic companion is, is getting um, Jamie back. Well, the, well, I mean, I mean, they're active, like 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 we said um, a couple episodes ago. I mean, they're actively trying to get Carol and Ford back. Sure, um, and that was the played Susan, the oh, granddaughter, granddaughter, mm -hmm. granddaughter. Um, and, you know, they're actively trying to get everybody they can. The original actress, or yeah, look like oh, no, okay. they're, yeah, she's still alive, she's still around. I would like to see Canine come back because last we heard he got cramped, and I know there's like tons of legal copyright stuff with They've... Canine because I did a blog about it. Um, can I hit my blog? Yeah. On um, BuzzyMag.com, I did a blog about everything you need to know about Canine, but that's not what it's called. But go to BuzzyMag and look for the Canine blog. Okay. But he's in a he's in a cluster of copyright hoo hoo. And the last we heard of Canine, he was I don't know. So I'm going to say Alpha Centauri, but that's wrong because I can't remember, which is why I wrote it down. Um, mending a black hole, and it was static. Well, they, 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 the thing is, what happened was the further what what happened, um, copyright rights, they they worked out a lot of it. Oh, good. Because um, in the later episodes of the Sarah Jane, uh, uh, Sarah Jane, Sarah Jane Adventures, they brought Canine back, and yeah, he was, he, and, and, and he was more of a, um, he wasn't. A, a cast member. He was a re he became a recurring cast. Oh, sorry, he went with the little boy off the college. Yes. I remember that. And then okay. actually, I watched. Spoilers. Yeah, oh, I actually watched the Australian oh, um, K9 show. Yeah, okay. oh. I watched the whole thing. Not bad. You can fly now. Yeah, I, I, I mean they redesigned it. I mean, it wasn't. Don't get don't he get me wrong. Sarah Jane hover, Does he? Uh, he no, he, he never hovers in Sarah Jane. S steps are still his his vein. Mm -hmm. Um. But it wasn't bad. I, I think in a lot of ways, the K-9 show was better than the Search and Smith Adventures. I'm going to say you're right without um, having seen it. And I'm actually looking forward to the second season of it when, when oh, they start producing it. Yeah, they, it, it did well enough to get a Maybe they season. can get Matt Smith to do a guest spot on the K-9 show. Oh, I doubt that. that would be because it, cause it's done by Australian, Australian. Disney. Oh. Well, you know, give it time and Disney will own it. Disney buys the BBC just for Doctor Who, and we can get our finally get our Star Wars Doctor Who Avengers crossover. It's be it'll be um, Doctor Tate picks up Deadpool and yeah. Deadpool with two lightsabers and can travel around all of time and space no. both long long ago and then. You can know. you cram in Jack Skeleton and just? Cause you got to cram great. in and, and somehow Johnny Depp doing something. And Johnny Depp as the voice of the Dardis. Okay. <laughs> So, oh. Since we started talking about uh, your blog on Buzzy Mag, yes. um, what else do you have in the pipeline? What else are you working on? Things like that. Okay. Um, well, I am a professional vampirologist, yes. which, is, which is a mythologist that specializes in cross-cultural studies with a focus on vampire studies. Um, and what that means is I know everything there is to know about uh, the historical and mythological vampires. But I'm also very well versed in mythology. And so I write lots of historical nonfiction reference books for academia, including Encyclopedia of Vampire Mythology and Encyclopedia of Demons and World Religions, coming out 
not by the time you see this, but next year will be an encyclopedia or a dictionary on fairy folklore and legend. Um, I also do several blogs a month for buzzymag.com. I try to maintain my own website, but I'm nobody's web designer, so don't go there thinking what you're going to get, because you're going to be underwhelmed. Um, I also do, um, I write for um, Bare Bones Multiverse. I do uh, writing for their supplements, but I use a pen name, which I'm not going to tell you, but if you buy enough of our products, you'll be able to figure it out, so buy our products and figure it out. Um, what else do I have coming up? Um, the thing on your shirt. <gasps> oh <my God. laughs> Also, the Bare Bones Multiverse is doing a Kickstarter for um, Davy Beauchamp's iPod cast for The Amazing Pulp Adventures of Mr. Adventure, and it will be an RPG campaign setting for Sapphire City. The city of tomorrow, today. Thank you, which is on the bottom of the shirt, and I don't have the energy to stand. That's so fine. So I'm, yeah. just, I'm just glad the three of us aren't wearing the shirt, because that was just going to be really <laughs> heavy-handed, I think. Yeah. yeah, that would have been really... But, um, and it's going to be amazing fun. It's in the bare bones system. You can check it out. And Davy has written a, a really good supplement for this. It's just chock full of wonderful infant bits of information. If you're a fan of the podcast, which has been nominated six times or nine times for Parset. Something like that. Lots of times for Parset. Um, you will absolutely buy the book for spoilers and insider stuff because it's just amazing, the, the stuff you'll learn. And it's, it's a lot of fun, I think, the world. I think you'll enjoy it. Even if you don't use the bare bones system, which you should, you should buy the book for compare. You turn it into a Dark Heresy game and put Sapphire City there. That should rock. Um, that would be pretty cool and a little scary. <laughs> So, I can't believe I forgot the Kickstarter. So, um, getting back to your... By the time this comes out, the Kickstarter will be over. Yeah, so. uh, far, long over. So, but I have a question, because you're a vampire biologist. Yes, um, I have a question about a particular type of vampire. I'm going to hit you on it. <laughs> you're going to hit me. No, so, he's, he's actually talking about sexy fish vampires. No. <laughs> oh, I was hoping. Okay. No, you know, you know there's this series of books... On spider wings. Just in case you want to know, <laughs> this is old. This is old. This is an old joke. This has been old yeah. for a long time. This it is has. that poop that is petrified so much that it's, it's but, just like, is but, that a garden gnome? But I heard you, Teresa. I do. Too. Yes. And I will let everyone in on the joke. I do yeah. not read a lot of fiction. I have never read Spiderwick, although I approve of the cover art. Mm, um, and that's a relic. And yes. I understand that there are vampires in it. So. Who knew? Very, very funny. <laughs> exactly. So if you have questions about the vampires in Spiderwick, email Davey as quickly as no, you can. I, Drew, questions. he raised his hand so he knows about them. I, I've read the books. But I, I, I don't know about fictional vampires, particularly the Spiderwick vampires, because I haven't read the Spiderwick books. Um, if you I'm want so to know about the vampires in Jim Butcher's Dresden verse, I can answer those questions, because I'm one of Jim's beta readers, and I've read all of his books numerous times. Now, I, 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 this, don't, don't hate me for this one. I'm actually kind of curious, because you have, this is kind of like an off-the-wall sort of question, because you have studied all, all these vampires mm -hmm. across... Time and space. Time and space, cultures and stuff. How, I mean... I, Stephanie Myers, I, a lot of people think she, she, she butchered them, especially with making them sparkly and stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that even remotely resembles like a sparkly vampire? I'm just, just on my own personal curiosity. Okay. Is there anything that resembles her, that type of vampire? No, but. Okay. There is one species of vampires. It's, it's, I'm going to mispronounce it, but I'm going to say Zume, because I like the Italian pronunciation of things when I don't know how to pronounce something, because it sounds foreign and exotic. Um, when they walk, they create sparks. And that's as close as you're going to okay. get to a Stephanie Myers vampire. But you have to understand that Stephanie Myers vampires, like 99% of all modern fictional vampires, are based on Anne Rice's vampires, yeah. which are based on Bram Stoker's vampires. Yeah. And that is the progenitor of fictional vampires, in my opinion. There are other fictional vampires before Bram yeah. Stoker, but the fictional character, and he is fictional, of Count Dracula, yeah. Um, is really what most other authors base their fictional yeah. vampires on. So, other than, than Count Dracula, there's the Zume, which creates sparks yeah. when they walk. Otherwise, the only other vampires that wear body glitter would be like club growers and yeah. like Vampire the Masquerade. Lestat, probably. Yeah. probably. Oh, definitely Lassat. No, it's because, really? I mean, I'll say that your, your, your encyclopedia that you did with McFarland Press it is quite impressive because uh, my mom actually got me a copy. She's a good mom. Which I got her to sign and stuff. <laughs> I did. Um, no, I mean, because honestly, the first time I was really ever exposed to, you know, the vast cultural differences of vampires actually came out of a uh, 
Dragon Magazine. Uh, it was one of the Ravenloft issues. They actually had the A to Z to uh, vampires. And, you know, I was like, wow, this is really cool. I learned all about these. And that really opened my world to, you know, the cultural aspect of the vampire past, you know, what you see in movies and film mm -hmm. and things like that. So, I mean, I've always found that, that very, very fascinating. Well, I, I can't speak for film and movie because I heard a startling statistic once that there's something like 1,500 vampire-related books in some form or another released every month. I don't know how true that is, but I heard that. And there's no way anybody could keep up to date with fiction, even if a third of that was true. But from a historical and mythological point of view, strictly speaking academically, there's just a little over 600 different species of, of vampires. Oh, well, I actually have another question. I, that I'm I can't about it. No, 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 not that. Okay. Um, does it seem like every culture in the world has their own version of the vampire? Yes, every culture that has ever existed has their own uh, type of vampire. They don't necessarily use the word vampire, yeah. like they'll use fish taco or, yeah. or Nosferatu, whatever it is they use, but it's sort of like a, a cultural stepping stone. Like at some point, people uh, invent language, they yeah. invent currency, they invent music, they have a vampire, and it's, it's interesting to see at what point in their social development where they come along with a, with a vampire. Um, and it's just, it's just something every culture yeah. has. If, if you don't get to the vampire, it seems like you don't make that next social step to whatever it is that you go on to next. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So uh, do, we have, do you have anything else you want to say, Pam, Dr. Hugh, anything? I think that everyone should Google, as soon as they finish watching this, Amazing Pulp Adventures RPG, because I don't know when this will air, but um, if, if this Kickstarter is over, there might be another Kickstarter for one of the other books, because Davy is under a multi-book contract, which is called Crow Games, to write between five and twelve more books. He doesn't know it yet. <laughs> this is why he's laughing right now, because, oops, spoiler. Yeah. Um, spoiler Drew, get ready. You guys oh, I'm ready. Adventures are right. I don't tell the adventures and, are ready. And Drew is writing a uh, um, a module for it. Yes. Do you want to see the name of it? Dun dun dun. Dun dun dun. Museum of Death. Um, it, assuming that that now yeah, it's gonna stay that one. Museum of Death is good. It's it's it's, it's, a, it's a strong working title. It's, it's a, a very, very strong. It's a working great title. working title. Um, but there might be other Kickstarters for other uh, art, uh, amazing pulp adventures yeah. RPGs. Um, By the way, um, Barebones Multiverse. Uh, Probably the only system I have ever read where I feel that you could successfully make a Doctor Who role-playing game out of. Wow, thank you. And, and, I've, I've, and that's above I've, the Doctor Who RPG. Most, <laughs> of, most of the Doctor Who RPGs were pretty pretty crap. Um, and it's, and it's I say this, mechanics. it's a rule book case. And it's because everyone wants to be Dungeons and Dragons and mm -hmm. that Doctor has nothing to do with that. Combat should really never play much of a part in a role playing Not game with Doctor it, Who. Yeah. If, if I can go on for a few minutes. Yeah, I'll say that because with the bare bones system, it's really about your vision. Mm -hmm. And I know like, and I use the Wolverine as an example, when you want to roll up your character in any other system, you want to play Wolverine. And you know in your head, Wolverine, what he can do and you know what the doctor can do. Right. And you don't want to play a watered down doctor. You don't want to play a character that will one day become the doctor you're envisioning. You want to sit down with your 2D6 and you want to play the doctor. Right. Absolutely. And with bare bones you can because you could take the skill Gallifreyan knowledge and you can apply that to <laughs> anything. You could be like, well, how do I work the TARDIS? Well, I'm going to roll on my skill Gallifreyan knowledge because they know how to do it. Well, what is this language? I'm going to roll on Gallifreyan knowledge because I, I have this. Or you could just, you can, as many ways as you can interpret to use a skill is is how you can do it. And well, I would also get the Doctor Endurance because he runs a lot. He does. But the, it's very important that you understand that we are not actually <laughs> making a Doctor Who role playing no, game. I'm no, saying that not. the system in which. Uh, We're saying you this already being, own yeah. the RPG Doctor Who and you're, you, you think your game mechanics are clunky. Purchase a copy of Bare Bones Multiverse, read our rule mechanics, and, and continue purchasing the Doctor Who products as source books, but use it in our game mechanics. And then everybody makes their money and we're all happy and nobody gets sued. That's the important part. Don't sue me. Have fun. Because all I own is this. <laughs> the only thing I've paid off in my life. <laughs> the shirt on your back. <laughs> Unless you want to buy it, I will sell it to you. And I will literally take it off very slowly because I have a pinched nerve in my neck. And it will, <laughs> it will not be sexy, but it will be funny. So, so um, we'll skip the news for this time. I sure. I want to hear the news. Oh, okay. I, look, I, you know, here's, I don't have it in front of me. 
but oh, okay. we we have a title of one of the episodes for uh, next thing. I'm not okay. sure how it got leaked. Um, I think it's called oh, Davy leaked. It. No, it's not Davy. Not it this time. It wasn't Davy. Not this time. I know that you know he's mm -hmm. he's got that phone line to Moffat and they yeah. talk. Um, uh, I feel like you could actually can go online. I think even the BBC site has this. Um, I've heard it on a number of other podcasts. The only title that we have is called Journey to the Center of the TARDIS. Ooh. So they're going to be the doing... Swing pool. <laughs> I would imagine that if we're actually going to get what that title promises, then yeah, we, we should see the swimming pool. But I'm, you ask any classic Whovian, and they are going to ask for everything... Uh, and the kitchen sink. The I zero room, even though it's gone. You know, I hope it's not a metaphor. The cloister room. And, and it may be, and it may be. Uh, I, I don't think it's the episode because that this, is where my, this is no, where my gamer no. girl will come out. I will have the graph paper, and I will be charting. They went down. <laughs> How many archways? The, and then a door. And I will be Honestly, the only thing I want from this, if, it, if they are doing a TARDIS thing, I want the classic... Things, the round things, the rondels. I, the rondels. I want, I want to see some classic rondels. Which makes no sense for a hallway. It really doesn't. It, it doesn't. But, I would, like but do you know rondel. that you can push on that rondel, open up, and very important circuitry that can destroy the TARDIS are right in there. I yes. Think, I think Turlo <laughs> messes something. Was it Mar Modern Undead? Yeah. Uh, Turlo goes really? in. Really? Yeah. Because I would do that by accident one night, just stumbling around in the dark. Yeah. I'd blow us all over. You know, no, they'll, they'll be wandering around and they'll find Chameleon. I who would is be a... the reason the TARDIS blew up in the Van Gogh painting. Again, I, again, why the Doctor would not ask me to travel with him and be like, all right, here we go, and everybody but you, <laughs> long guy. <laughs> you look too eager. Come on, just everyone else. Uh, I don't care if you have candy, just keep walking. You'd be the first rejected and I'm like, companion. But... But I'm a wizard. They said so. Ah, uh, you made your choice. Choose your <laughs> one. Have fun at Hogwarts. Hey, or, or, or you'd be the guy they bring on for half of the adventure and kill. Like the woman who who he gave his breath to, the tree woman. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I was like, I like her. She'd be the an awesome fourth, companion. Oh, yeah. she's, oh dead. she's dead. Damn, yeah. she would have been better than Rose. Oh well. No, oh, well. <laughs> no, I, I, I can't be the Damn guy from Eleventh Hour. Well, it's just like. Hey, blonde guy that everyone's paying attention to, who, who may or may have something questionable on his computer. You're gonna save the world, and it really looks like we're gonna pay attention to you in this late. Oh, we're never gonna see you again. Uh -huh. We're the couple. They're like, I'm the tall, skinny. He's the short, fat. We're the gay guy couple, and then one of them dies. Yeah. I'm like, I liked them. Why couldn't they have stayed? They were so candid and frank. I love that in people. <laughs> and then, and now they're dead and headless and in a bag somewhere. Dead and headless in a bag. News at eleven. Okay, so. Before we ramble on even further. Thanks for watching this. Uh, yes. So this is Gail Pipe Radio signing off of our interview with Teresa Bain, a vampireologist, and all around lovable and awesome lady. Um, so peace. Goodbye. Bye. Let's go. Got it on, on tonight It's hard